Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to Hudson Institute. Thank you for coming today. My name is Eric Brown. I work here at the Institute, and I'm happy to convene this panel on uh, the looming offensive in Mosul, its aftermath, and the imperative of what we think uh, of the next U.S. administration for bolstering our various allies in the region to be able to deal with uh, the continuing meltdown of governance and political order across the greater Levant from the eastern Mediterranean to western Iran, as well as the deepening ethno-sectarian struggles, which are both facilitating the breakdown of that order and taking advantage of that. Um, we think uh, there has been um, a single-minded focus on the military defeat of ISIS and not enough thinking about what the political defeat of ISIS, and indeed dealing with the core um, uh, political and security vacuum in the greater Levant uh, means, and how, in fact, we should bolster our allies to be able to cooperate with us to pursue not just strategic ends or military ends, but also the, the longer-term um, problem of reconstituting a political and a security order in the greater Levant that works for the people in the region and that's able to keep the meddling instincts of outside powers at bay uh, and able to provide um, uh, the real security for real populations, uh, which was lacking and which created the opportunity for ISIS to insinuate itself into Iraq in the first place and to establish itself in Mosul and in other places. So today what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, the, in what many see as the looming offensive in Mosul. There's still an opportunity, there's still a possibility that that offensive might slow down, um, uh, although uh, uh, when you look, speak to people in the country and elsewhere, uh, many people anticipate that this is going to be happening very soon. Um, it's also very clear that many people in Iraq have very different expectations about how the actual military conflict will unfold. Beyond that, there's also varying uh, uh, beliefs and uh, expectations about um, what the aftermath will look like. As we've seen, there's been some very uh, straight line projections made by, various, by the UN and by various humanitarian organizations that have said that the likely uh, humanitarian fallout uh, will likely affect at least 1.2 million people uh, in Mosul and in the surrounding areas. And it's not clear right now whether Iraq or, for that matter, Kurdistan and some of the surrounding polities are ready to absorb um, this huge amount of displaced peoples from this conflict. It's also not clear because the planning that has gone into this offensive has been rather opaque. And uh, I think from the perspective of a lot of people who have been studying it, um, uh, uh, not well organized. Uh, it's not clear whether there's going to be sufficient food and shelter for these people. It's also not clear uh, whether there's going to be sufficient protection uh, for these vulnerable people to be able to, uh, for them to be able to escape the reprisals from uh, groups in the region who will seek to exact revenge upon them. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, there is still uh, a lot of concern that a political strategy for reintegrating uh, ordinary Mosulawis into Iraq and into some broader regional security order that, that works for them, um, that that political strategy has remained elusive. Uh, there's no plan for keeping the peace in Mosul after the offensive. There's no plan as far as work. There's been no real effort to build the local governing capacity to be able to protect vulnerable populations uh, and thus, thus to address the, the power vacuum that's likely going to happen after ISIS is ousted from Mosul. This is likely going to cause a much greater catastrophe than what we have in northeastern uh, Iraq, and, excuse me, northwestern Iraq um, right now. Uh, it's a catastrophe uh, that will affect most directly our core allies in the greater Levant, including Iraq, Kurdistan, and Turkey, all of which, as we know, are experiencing enormous political crises internally right now, all of which have come under pressure both from the rise of ISIS, but also from the deepening ethno-sectarian quarrels across the region. For all of them, their governing structures have been tested and found wanting. And we think it's uh, a strategic priority of the United States to think more long-term about how to work with our partners on the ground to build them up, not just militarily, 
but to build them up politically and economically so that they're strong enough to be able to deal with these historic pressures which are acting against them. Uh, without this robust plan for strengthening our allies in the region, it's very clear, it, it strikes me as likely that any military success against ISIS will be uh, undermined um, uh, and that the strategic outcomes that we seek will remain elusive for a long time to come without helping to actually rebuild order in this broken land. So with that, I get to introduce our four uh, excellent speakers today, um, uh, all coming from very different backgrounds and with varied perspectives, all deeply concerned about the situation, and all thinking more long-term um, than I think our short-term policy, uh, 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 much, much further uh, than our short-term policy is right now. Our first speaker will be Mike Pregent. He's a colleague of mine here at Hudson Institute. For many years, he served as a US Army intelligence officer, including many years in Iraq, uh, working, among other places, uh, in Mosul, uh, as well as in Kurdistan. Um, uh, Mike and I are in deep agreement about so many issues. Um, uh, um, whether you uh, agree with Mike or not is another question, uh, but his analysis deserves to be understood and reckoned with because among other things it suggests that the humanitarian catastrophe that could follow from the impending uh, offensive against ISIS uh, is likely going to be needlessly worse than it actually will be. Um, and uh, it's important to understand the context uh, in which that offensive is taking place. After that, we'll have Dr. Dylan O'Driscoll, who's a research fellow at the Middle East Research Institute, which is based in uh, Erbil, Iraq. Dylan recently uh, published a really stellar uh, work of analysis that was based upon intensive interviews of people in Iraq, in Mosul, and elsewhere. Um, about planning uh, before and after uh, the Mosul Offensive. Um, and it's an it's a important document that deserves to be read. It represents, I think, what think tank analysts, um, it, it represents the best of what think tank analysts on their best days can offer to the policy process. Um, after that, we'll have the president of the Middle East Research Institute, Dr. Dilawar al Aldin. Uh, who I met uh, some years ago while he was serving in the KRG uh, regional government. Um, uh, Dulauer has a, has a checkered and, and varied career as an intellectual, um, uh, working on Kurdish issues as well as broadly Iraq issues. Uh, also uh, an epidemiologist, if I'm not mistaken. Or infectious disease. Michael. Infectious diseases. Very relevant um, to politics. And running uh, <laughs> ran a very, very, yeah, very relevant to politics. Ran a robust program in the United Kingdom for many years. Um, but um, uh, he has a deep sense of obligation to uh, his native Kurdistan and his native Iraq. And because of that, he went back <laughs> to serve in the KRG government and founded the Middle East Research Institute, which is an exception in the Middle East. And I say an exception world, globally, because it remains an independent voice of policy counsel and analysis. And it's institutes like that which will provide a, a fighting chance for Kurdistan and for Iraq going forward. It deserves all the support it can get to maintain that independence. Uh, and we're delighted to have Dr. al uh, Last, we'll have Dr. Bilal Wahab, uh, who I met at the American University of Iraq in Suleimania, where he had been a professor, among other things, of public policy and international affairs. Uh, he had also been involved deeply in conducting policy-relevant research on governance crisis and the economic crisis in Kurdistan and in Iraq more generally. Uh, Dr. Wahab has recently become the Soraf Fellow at the Washington Institute, and I can say that uh, I think his, um, his separation from AUIS is probably temporary, but I can say that this temporary separation from AUIS will be a loss for AUIS and the university but very much a gain for the Washington Institute and for the Washington discussion. So with that, I'd like to begin with my colleague, Mike. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with these, with my new colleagues, my new friends here. Um, one thing I'd like to say, so this is the 15th year anniversary of 9-11. Let me just put that in perspective. 90% um, of the force that's in Iraq right now and 90% of the force that's advising uh, U.S.-backed rebels in Syria joined the military after 
knowing they were going into harm's way against al-Qaeda and other groups. 75% of the force that's in Iraq and Syria now was not there during the surge, was not there in 2007, was not there in 2009. I had an opportunity to brief these units as they went to Iraq, and we asked the question, how many of you have been there before? And the senior graybeards raised their hand. The young force did not. So that's those are the great Americans that are in Iraq and Syria right now, men and women who joined after 9-11, knowing they're going into harm's way, and now they're in Iraq and Syria. Uh, let's counter that with the majority of people that are in ISIS. 90% of the fighters in ISIS are under the age of 30. 100% uh, of them are familiar with Iraq. 100% are familiar with what worked and didn't work if you're from Mosul, uh, with the exception of the foreign fighters. One of my eye-opening things in Mosul in 2005 when I was an advisor with the Peshmerga was I learned this phrase in Arabic, when al ijnabi, where are the foreigners? I say, fi ijnabi hina, are there foreigners here? Because I had studied Egyptian dialects, so I kind of I kind of sucked at speaking Arabic up in northern Iraq. But they said, bis enta, which means only you, bis entum, only you. And that taught me something, so well, they, they think we're foreigners too, because we're not doing things right. Let me go to not doing things right. In 2004 and 2005, we rubbled Fallujah. We punished a Sunni town to rid it of al-Qaeda fighters. About 1,000 to 8,000 al-Qaeda fighters were in Fallujah in 2004 and 2005. We rubbled it. We destroyed it. It didn't defeat al-Qaeda. It dispersed al-Qaeda and allowed them to make the argument to the Sunni population in Iraq that the U.S. force is biased against you. Look what they did to this town. Um, fast forward to the surge. 2007, we weren't rubbling cities anymore. We weren't rubbling buildings. In 2006, when I was in Mosul, we weren't rubbling buildings. We were not punishing population centers. We went out, developed relationships, found out that we were thought of as foreigners as well, tried to build good relationships with the locals by empowering them, uh, by using U.S. leverage to put pressure on Baghdad to empower local citizenry, to trust their government, to join the military. If you look at the Iraqi security forces circa 2007, Mosul was deemed safe enough to move Iraqi units and American units to participate in the Baghdad security plan. The Baghdad security plan was to, there to root out al-Qaeda from the Sunni neighborhoods, but it also did another thing, and that's the big contrast now. It was also to protect the population, not only from al-Qaeda, but from the very Shia militias that are now part of the Hashid al-Shabi now. The same IRGC-backed militias like Asad Ahul Haq, like Kitab Hezbollah, like Kitab Imam Ali, like Sadr's Promised Day Brigades, were also targeted by U.S. and Iraqi forces. Targeted in the sense that you do not get to go into these Sunni neighborhoods and indiscriminately target, indiscriminately punish Iraq's citizens. You're not allowed to do these things. And the Iraqi government, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure on Maliki and his government at the time, um, we, we, we use U.S. leverage to do that. We don't have that leverage now. We're not choosing to use that leverage now. And, and if you look at the current ISIS strategy, and this is, this is my, the main point of, of why I like to talk about these things, is this current U.S. US strategy to punish and depopulate Sunni towns where ISIS is actually in control or ISIS actually has a presence is resetting the conditions that led to ISIS to begin with. I'm more comfortable with a Sunni Arab from or a Mosulawi sitting in a coffee shop saying that, hey, did you hear the Americans are working with the Iranians? And having a discussion. I'd rather it be a conspiracy theory than for them to actually validate that by watching TV and seeing Qasem Soleimani, seeing Abu Mehdi al Mohandas, a designated terrorist leader of Qatab Hezbollah, deputy commander of the Hashid al Shabi. Hadi al Amri, Iran's premier IRGC proxy in, in Iraq, who is the leader of the Hashid al Shabi, celebrating the, the retaking of a Sunni town, whether it be Tikrit, Fallujah, or Ramadi. And if we look at this strategy so far, what have we done? 80% of Ramadi is destroyed. We don't have UN and, and US media in Ramadi touting the successes of the reconstruction program the successes of bringing Sunnis back into the Iraqi military, to uh, uh, building a hold force that will protect the population from both ISIS 
When I say protected, empower the Sunni population to reject ISIS. Empower the Sunni population to protect itself from other actors like, like the militias. We're not seeing that. We're not seeing that in Fallujah. We're not seeing that in Tikrit. What we're seeing is these celebrations when you simply rubble a city, create a refugee exodus, punish a population, and then plant a flag where ISIS had its flag. That is not success. That's not permanent success. That's a temporary PR event that's touted by the administration as a, an example of its ISIS strategy working. And that's one of the biggest problems. So I, I, I have, I spent a lot of time in Mosul. Uh, I've visited it twice in the last six months. I visited uh, former Peshmerga generals I've worked with and I've talked to refugees in KRG, KRG camps, refugee camps in the KRG. Uh, I asked who used to be in the military, who was a former Sons of Iraq, uh, who, who is a former ISOF guy, and how many of you think the U.S. should do more? And that's who I go and talk to and ask for solutions. And then when I talked to the Peshmerga commanders in the field, I said, ISIS is in that direction. There's eight guys in that town. They've got trenches, but the Hashid al-Shabi are over there. And they've got um, Iraqi flags, they've got military equipment, and they're starting to encroach on these positions. So there's a lot to this. So as we look to Mosul, we're already talking about keeping the Hashid al-Shabi out, the Shia militias, but their leaderships are saying, we're gonna be there. It's apparent that they're, am I taking too much time? It, it, it's, it's important to, to remember that they need to be part of the Mosul op in order to get the benefits of the 2018 political campaign, meaning the leaders of these of militias need to be part of this. Um, the government's saying they're not going to be part of it. They're saying, they're saying they are. They've been a part of everything they've wanted to be a part of, and they cannot be a part of the Mosul operation. What we need to do with the Mosul operation is slow it down, take over the airfield that used to be called Diamondback and Merez, begin a recruiting drive, bring back in 30,000 U.S. trained former Sunnis, Shia, uh, Kurdish, and Christian back into the 2nd Iraqi Army Division, the one that fell, the one that fell because it was politicized by Maliki and replaced with loyalists. Uh, bring that back in. D develop this into a slowed down, intelligence-driven operation. Nothing will hurt ISIS more than having a local force recruited of Mosulawis that are being trained on an airfield in the ISIS capital of Iraq to go after high value targets. That will have a crippling effect. And the most important thing is it does not cause a refugee exodus. It empowers the community. It shows that the U.S. is gonna use its leverage and its guarantor status to help. The biggest problem is Baghdad won't let us do it. This administration is not interested and I'm not sure either candidate knows what to do at this point going forward, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Mike. Dr. O'Driscoll. Uh, thank you very much for having me, first of all, and for speaking so nicely about the report. Uh, the main kind of thing that I'm trying to get across in, in my report on, on the future of Mosul is that we are nowhere near ready to liberate Mosul uh, on, any, on any grounds apart from militarily. I mean, if you look at uh, humanitarian kind of thing, they're ready for, they say, about 120,000 people. We're talking for about 1.2 million people. So what's going to happen to these people? Where are they going to live? If you look at it from the reconstruction point of view, there are no plans with regards to that. There's no kind of processes in place. If you look at it from the political, forget about it. So the only, the only way we're ready is to go destruct the city of Mosul and what's going to happen post this. So this is the point that I'm trying to get across. You know, the liberation of Mosul has become a political agenda. Um, the Prime Minister of Iraq, he's, you know, he, he's not that strong, he's, he's kind of weak, and he promised he was going to be liberated before the end of 2017. So what happens to him if he doesn't? Uh, if you look at the US thing, they also they want to liberate it before the end of 2017 as well, because it's, it's become a political tool. Uh, you know, two million people are not a political tool. If you liberate Musa now and use it as a political tool, you're going to pay for this for the next, for the next few years. Uh, definitely the people of Iraq are going to pay for it for a long time. So then going into the actual, the actual events that led to the rise of ISIS, you know, the marginalization of the Sunnis has been extreme. And this resulted in them saying, how, how, how are we going to address this? Uh, is the central government going to address us? No. So we can go to other aspects. Has this, has this been solved? No. If anything, it's gotten worse. Two things happened recently. Uh, the first thing that happened was the Prime Minister of Iraq, Abadi, he said that the Hashd al-Shabi will participate. This was a few days ago. He said they'll participate in the liberation of Mosul. Now, the Nineveh Provincial Council voted unanimously that they should not participate. Every single member voted. They said no. They represent the people of Nineveh. 
they represent the people who are living in Musa. So if you, are, if you are a person living under ISIS in Musa right now, and you hear that the Prime Minister of Iraq is saying that we're going to send in this thing that your politician said no, how, how, do you, how are you going to feel? Are you going to feel that you are actually being listened to? Do you, are you going to feel that the Iraqi central government represents you? The second thing that happened was the Minister of Defense was, well, he has since been fired. Uh, well, he had a vote of no confidence. So he was, he's from Musul. If he's, when I was speaking to the Nineveh Provincial Council members, I was saying, okay, who's going to liberate Musul? What forces can come into the city? Surprisingly, they all said the Iraqi army, first and foremost. And I said, why? They left you. They abandoned you. 800 ISIS soldiers came in, took the city, and now you're telling me it's okay for them to come liberate you. And they told me it's changed. You know, we have this Sunni representative from Musul, and he's changed the army. It's not the army of Maliki. It's not the army that was corrupt. It's not the army that was coming in, uh, robbing our shops, putting us on the terrorist list for no reason. It's not the same army. Again, he's gone. If you are, if you are Sunni from, from Musa, what are you going to think about this? Does the central government, has anything changed? Is marginalization still there? Yes, it is. Are you, are you, are you listened to? No, you're not. So this is an issue that, that is going to affect the, the liberation. Yes, you can go in militarily, but what's going to happen? Nothing, is, n nothing has changed. So people are going to, either ISIS is going to come back again, or it's going to come to something far worse. And, and this is my fear. You know, if you don't address these structural and political failures, ISIS will just come and it'll be worse. Uh, then you talk about on the local level, they also say there's no political agreement. So I was speaking to a lot of the actors from Nineveh, from Musul, asking them about their visions for the future. All of them were different. But these people, they're not meeting to discuss it. They who have the former governor, the current governor, won't even meet in the same room. Now, these people both have visions for how, how they are going to try and take uh, power once this vacuum that when ISIS is gone. And they all have militias. There's militias everywhere in Mosul. Every single political actor has a link to a militia. Now, if they have, do not have a political agreement, they're not coming together, what's going to happen? They're all going to fight over ownership. They're going to try and maneuver in there, and they all have their militias. So this, for me, is a very big fear. Again, we are not ready for this. No one's discussing this. No one's addressing it. All they're addressing is the, political, uh, is the military means. They're not addressing these political means. So then, if you move on from this, we need to have elections in Nineveh as well, once there's a period of stabilization. Because if you look at the governance in Nineveh, so you have the Nineveh Provincial Council, they have been operating outside of the territory they govern for two and a half years. The current governor of Mosul has never, of Nineveh, has never governed from within Nineveh. So here's a governor who's solely had his whole career as a governor outside of, outside of the province. How, how can he address all these issues that are going to come? You know, the dynamics have changed. People feel that the politicians have failed them. So therefore, they need to have a choice in who's going to represent them. Now, my fear about these elections is the fact that actually when you speak to the politicians, they all want elections as well. They shouldn't. You know, they, they, failed, they, they failed immensely. And the fact that they want elections is a fear that these elections are not going to be true. They're going to be corrupt. So therefore, international uh, actors have to play a very big role in these elections. They also have to make sure that they are fair. Finally, if I just go to the disputed territories, this is also a big issue. The disputed territories in Nineveh also have to be addressed. There has been a push and pull between Baghdad and Erbil. Who is going to take this territory? What's going to happen? But while this has happened, no one has given this territory the services they need. No one has given this territory the security they need. The people in these disputed territories, they, they deserve to have a choice in this as well. As long as Article 140 is there, in my opinion, this will never be discussed. This will never, there will be no local actors having a choice in their future. It's always going to be there prevented, prevented from being implemented and nothing will happen. Now what could happen is that it's taken by force and then this will only, you know, result in a host of other problems. So this has to be prevented as well. So there, once again, there need to be discussions on this. This needs to be on the political agenda of everybody in Nineveh, in Iraq, and particularly in the U.S. government, because I don't think you realize how, how people in Nineveh, you know, are waiting for America to help them, are waiting for them to give some direction. They, this is what they all talked about me. They would talk about Bremer for half an hour, you know, saying how bad he was, how whatever, the guy would be insulting for half an hour. Five minutes later, when I asked, so, so what's going to happen with the politi politics? They say, we're waiting for America. What, what's America going to do to help us? So, I mean, you don't realize what, what, what a big role that you can play. So just to finalize, what I'm trying to say is that you can defeat ISIS military very easily, but this will be a hollow victory. The repercussions of this will go on for years and years and years, and the people of Iraq will suffer, and as you know, they've suffered long enough. 
Thank you very much, Dylan. I, speaking of the political problem, which has remained unaddressed, I recall speaking in 2009 to some um, uh, Sunni Arab tribal leaders from the surrounding areas around Mosul, um, who warned in 2009 that from their perspective they saw al-Qaeda coming back. And of course these were the same people who had successfully liberated their hometowns from al-Qaeda only a few years before. I asked them specifically what they needed to prevent that and what they wanted to prevent that. <coughs> and one man said to me, um, we want what the Kurds have, by which he meant a region in which they could exercise self-rule, as is permitted by the Iraqi constitution, in which they could provide for their own security, and in which they could pursue their own un development in an autonomous fashion, so long as they are not a threat to their neighbors or, frankly, to their populations. In other words, Kurdistan had emerged as a model uh, for not just the Sunni Arab areas of Iraq, but for other uh, vulnerable populations across the greater Levant. It's important to keep that in mind. Sadly, though, on my last trip to Kurdistan, um, uh, the, um, the consequences of the last uh, uh, years of war against ISIS, uh, uh, among other things, were, were not only simply making themselves shown, uh, but were clearly also contributing to an unraveling of the political compact, which is the basis of the modern KRG. Um, if that unravels, it would be, in my view, uh, catastrophic for Kurds, number one. It would be also very bad for Iraqis, more generally. And it would be uh, disastrous for the U.S. as well, uh, because we rely on the Kurds um, to maintain a, a, um, a line against uh, ISIS to, to be a model in the region. Um, uh, so on the eve of the potential Mosul offensive, um, it's only right to ask Dr. DeLauer, uh, is Kurdistan ready, number one? And number two, how can the next U.S. administration think about bolstering and improving Kurdistan's capacity to deal, not what, just with the immediate fallout from Mosul, but also uh, with this uh, broader um, uh, problem that we see across the greater Levant? Thank you. Well, thank you, Eric. Um for hosting us, and, and thanks to uh, Hudson Institute. And I want to thank you all for turning up. I was uh, <clears throat> listening to my colleagues and putting myself in your shoes and say, what a mess, what a quagmire. Do you really want to be involved uh, for a long term? Um, uh, but of course the answer is yes. Uh, I will focus on um, different aspect of the same uh, uh, same story, and that is Mosul. Um, I want to make a case that the, this current and the next U.S. administration needs to really look closer to events, look at the complexity, look at the evolution of history, look at the evolution of the entire dynamics uh, in Iraq and in the region, and then decide, uh, is it uh, or is it not in the national security interest of the United States to be closer, to engage more, to have a review of the past few years' uh, policies or not. Uh, I also uh, wish to look at the other side uh, in this partnership and, and look at the Iraqis to see whether Iraqis have actually uh, learned anything from the past, risen up to the responsibility, are likely to put their house in order or not. Uh, if not, can America help in that for mutual interest? Um, for us, uh, the way we look at um, Mosul, um, you just heard on the ground, at the local actors level, uh, all the way to almost national, Iraqi national sort of uh, level. But actually, if you look at it from, uh, from the American point of view or with the, with the bird's eye view of events, uh, Mosul constitutes a major milestone transformation in the region. Militarily, it's obvious for Iraq's structure and integral, or, or for Iraq's uh, communities uh, and politics, it's going to be transformational. Uh, people will always remember before and after Mosul, uh, and, and relations between components within Iraq will be different. But more importantly, we believe that uh, United States engagement with the region will be different. A lot of people believe that after Mosul is liberated militarily, the United States priorities will change, uh, will move on, will inevitably have to go. Uh, the focus will switch to Syria, and then after Syria may go elsewhere. 
given the track record of this current administration, there will be a tendency to go back to almost total disengagement with Iraq, with the consequence of actually coming back this time with ISIS's offsprings, which would have mutated like microbes do, as I, I like that word because of my background. <sighs> If you look at the, the past, 2000, uh, past uh, uh, 13 years or so, um, I would characterize uh, U.S. engagement in Iraq in, in three phases. Uh, 2003 to 11 uh, was one phase where America was um, present with, uh, uh, with troops, with commitment of resources, uh, whether that is uh, human uh, capital or what have you. So it was like an overwhelming presence. Uh, uh, engaged in nation building, trying to sort Iraq out, trying to stabilize it, fight terrorism and lead on the ground and use all its leverages to make Iraqis uh, get online. But of course it was very costly um, uh, and Iraqi leaders proved to be um, really a disappointing elite who did not rise up to the responsibility. There were no father figures among them. They were not building their own nation. They were not reciprocating, so uh, let alone a lot of them not even being grateful to the American sacrifices that are made. So the reaction was um, uh, from America, from the public, from politicians, was to, to retreat 180 degrees and complete disengage. Now that complete disengagement was um, a mistake. Uh, we knew it at the time, and a lot of experts, advisors, uh, to the U.S. administration said this is not correct because that is where a vacuum was created. The United States was leading, okay, that was too much, on the ground, hands-on, uh, too extensively in in involved. Uh, but, of course, Iraq and the Middle East, after this Arab Spring, after the change of uh, the entire region and its dynamics, it needed leadership. That leadership had to be uh, a force that is, uh, or a power, a global power that is committed to liberty, stability, uh, to good governance and, and peace. Now, after the United States left Iraq, there was a vacuum. This vacuum was filled by regional powers, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, as well as the local uh, actors, none of them, none of whom were committed to the same values as the United States. So there was no process of actually continuing to build up, preventing terrorism, reconciling between communities, strengthening institutions of democracy, reforming the state, the governance system, and making every Iraqi own the, the country's future uh, as, as well as present. So that gap created what led to ISIS, and we heard a lot about that. And ISIS, the moment it emerged in Mosul, that was the transformation, that was a milestone. In fact, the I think it was somebody in the administration, or Mr. Obama himself, said it may take years before we get everything back to normal. Somebody even men mentioned the magic word three years, and that's what we are seeing. Three years it took to go back to what 800 people did to Mosul. So after Mosul, there will be a new phase. And if America decides to completely disengage again, we will see a continuation of this vacuum because Iraqis, left alone, will not do it. They are fast uh, driving towards the bottom. They are uh, very good experts in, um, in disagreeing, in polarizing, in fragmenting, and so on. Uh, I'm not here suggesting that the United States should go in and do it for them, to do the same as before under uh, Bush administration, not to actually commit any resources, any more than they are now, or maybe less, we, we expect. We don't want them to go and lead and then take leadership but engage constructively, use the leverages of, uh, available to make the Iraqis do what is right for their country. They need, they have that, these leverages, they have the ability, they have the presence, and Iraqis do need America. And they, a lot of them, not all of them, some of them, they're in love with America, they appreciate its presence, they're loyal until they get disappointed time and time again. And the Sunnis desperately need America. Um, they, uh, in fact, the, even the Shias, uh, who were once united against America, are now so fragmented and so worried, and they are so um, overwhelmed in the past by the Iranian uh, overwhelming domination, 
Now they, they appreciate more and more engagement from America. So everybody expects that, but, but of course everybody is now realistic. They don't expect America to come and do it for them, commit people on the ground uh, or, or any more than there is or any uh, resources like that, but political engagement and using these leverages. Otherwise, if you look at today's Iraq, Baghdad had institutions of democracy built in and a constitution uh, adopted with a real uh, political process uh, taking off uh, over the last 10 years. And there were promises of for the future. There was potential that could, could enhance itself. But what happened is what happened. We know how it fragmented, it disintegrated, and it, uh, uh, ISIS was able to break Iraq uh, almost beyond repair. So Baghdad's co uh, institutions are not working anymore. Baghdad is a dysfunctional state now. And it is actually deteriorating gradually, not fast, not breaking suddenly, but it is gradually deteriorating, going fast towards failure. Right. Left alone, it will fail. Failure of any nation in the Middle East is disaster. The parliament is not focused. It's uh, 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 self-destructing. It's doing the wrong thing. It's uh, too uh, engaged in the good old uh, days politics. The government is half uh, vacant uh, cabinet posts and, and uh, run by deputizations in every ministry. And uh, the sovereign ministers are being ticked one after the other. Mr. Abadi does not anymore enjoy the full support of the House of Shia. Uh, uh, or the Sunnis altogether, and now even the Kurds. And every component you name is fragmented. There was a time when the Kurds were the best, and they were kingmakers by the fact that they were united and they were one voice. Now they are more fragmented than any other. If anything, the fragmentation starts in Kurdistan and spills over into Baghdad. So we don't have anyone. Kingmakers gone, and uh, united fronts, and people providing vision, strategy, way forward, they're gone. Kurdistan, or once the, uh, 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 the, the island of decency, as Tom Friedman put it, and the emerging nation that was holding promise, it is still full of potential, still the place that can be, still it will be a partner that US can deserve, uh, deserves and U.S. can make it a, a partner for the future. But guess what? Divided, polarized, the parliament is completely paralyzed, uh, the government is weakening and the politics is so uh, fragmented such that we fear the future that there may be even further division between the Kurds in terms of having separate regions. These are happening in the, at the time when everybody needs unity against ISIS. Now, what is the United States doing uh, about these things or how do they engage these different partners? It has, been, it has been very difficult. If you ask any U.S. ambassador, any diplomat, they tell you what a nightmare it was. It is, and compared to the past, it was heaven when it was just the war, and, and that's it. The rest was like all cooperation. Now, if the uh, 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 from the uh, United States point of view, the way we see it, the United States policy now is almost entirely focused around ISIS. Everything United States does now in Baghdad in Erbil. Every help they offer, every negotiation they have, every visit that, that we see. Okay, they talk about a lot of other things. They talk about loans, they talk about institutionalization, they talk about some lovely things, but they always are focused around uh, ISIS. Now, I mentioned the uh, fragmentation, and you guys mentioned the fragmentation at, the, at that level. And imagine not having the right partner leading their own country. Who are you going to design your strategy, your future with? And I. I, I want to highlight one more thing that Dylan, or, or Dylan almost did, um, is that uh, if you look at the Mosul uh, fabric and, and its landscape, um, it, it, it was uh, the, the, a unique place in the world, cradle of so many ethnic and religious minorities that have been there for about four or 5,000 years. They're just disappearing. Uh, in the last 12, 13 years, we've lost a million Christians who were speaking the Aramaic language of Jesus Christ. Yazidis predate all of them, and they are now uh, not trusting uh, any government around them, and they are victims of that. And migration is, there are Shabaks who have disappeared from the region, and there are Sabi Mandaeans, and there are Kakes. Now, these people, interestingly, also between them, they don't trust each other. The Christians and the Shabaks are at each other's throats because they see each other as threat on land, on property. 
within the Christian community, they're fragmented, influenced by KRG, Baghdad, America, and what is left of them, and they want arms. They want to be armed. You look at the uh, 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 Yazidis, uh, um, between, again, KRG, PKK, uh, Baghdad and, and, and the rest, they are again fragmented, polarized, armed, and so on. So imagine to, uh, top to bottom, bottom up, horizontal transverse. In every way, this society is fragmented. Now, do we need to point fingers at anyone to say whose fault it was? I don't think that helps. I think what we should say is that this is where history brought us. This is where the the social fabric brought us. This is where the religion, the, the clash of the world, the civilizing, everything. This is us. You can't just say reject it all because that's a nightmare. Well, this is us and we will be like this. Not now, but for another thousand years. Can you leave the, United, the, the, the Middle East to its own accord and say that is, few, uh, 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 that is a nightmare, there are too many superpowers in this world, we can't do it for them, it's a quagmire, and they better do it for themselves. Um, and it's, it's uh, few, quite a few thousand miles away from us. It doesn't matter what it does, because the disengagement of 2011 led to the comeback of the United States. The United States cannot leave, cannot shelf you know, uh, the Middle East, cannot shelf Iraq, cannot uh, disengage with Iraq. I'm happy in the Q&A uh, uh, period to talk about what I mean in, in more detail by engagement and constructive engagement and so on. What is it that the United States can do? I know a lot of you say, forget it. This administration next will not do what you expect because we are, our fingers are burnt. We can't do this. We can't do that. You guys need to do it themselves. We are in this together. We have to together. And we need, thank God, we need academics to look at complex situations and provide complex answers. But where there is a will, there is a way, and a roadmap can be designed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't want to add uh, more pessimism to the fragmentation <laughs> uh, image that uh, Dr. Dlauer uh, portrayed, but I could not agree more. And that's... Uh, uh, that's the level of fragmentation that we have in Iraq and Kurdistan in the presence of a common enemy. So you are talking about post-ISIS Iraq. So imagine what will happen to these different groups with different political agendas, different regional affiliations and loyalties, and who are also armed. What will happen when that common enemy is gone? And, and that's why focusing mainly on defeating ISIS uh, without having uh, thought through the day after ISIS or the day after the liberation of Mosul, if not rubbing it, uh, is, will be a, a, a very serious mistake. The issues of, of governance, of, of a nation building, of institution building, making sure that the goal is not just defeating ISIS, but leaving a stable country behind, or, or, or helping maintain a stable country behind. As Dr. Lauer mentioned, it's not enough just to defeat the enemy, uh, it's also important to make sure that the situation and the, and the context and the ecosystem for uh, a reincarnation of that enemy, uh, mutation of that enemy, to use a medical term, uh, is, is also maintained, that you don't see a new version of Al-Qaeda, a new version of, uh, of ISIS. The, the Kurdistan region has been a safe haven, has been a beacon of hope in an otherwise uh, turmoil Middle East, uh, but again, unfortunately, uh, the moment of the Kurds that many talked about, the moment for Kurdish independence, a Kurdish statehood, more autonomy, maybe a, a flag of Kurdistan in the United Nations, we are escaping that moment uh, more and more because of, uh, because of our own undoing. Uh, when I say our, I mean the Kurdish uh, undoing. The internal fissures, the political discourse, the, what I call the chicken wing factory, every political party has started having more and more wings and more and more factions uh, within them. The, the disputes not only between KRG and Baghdad, but between the different cities and different political parties within Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, we had a civil war that started in 1994 with the pressure of the United States. Madeleine Albright at the time was Secretary of State, brought the Kurdish leaders, uh, Talibani and Barzani, to this town, forced them to shake hands, literally, uh, and that gave us peace, but ha that has not put an end to those uh, fault lines within Kurdish politics. We still have a political party 
ruling Soleimani uh, with about uh, you know 50 percent of the political leverage and Peshmerga force and and, and security forces, and then we have uh, Erbil being controlled by uh, the the KDP by Mr. Barzani's party, who is also equally important. And each of these parties have their own regional alliances. Uh, economic interests, patronage networks, and despite having a facade of unified government that had the potential of actually becoming a reality, uh, the absence of an overwhelming power that can engage both of them, that can engage uh, and encourage uh, nation building and, and institution building, uh, the Kurds actually went back to, to the fragmentation. Right now, um, the Kurds were probably the only group that at least were united in Baghdad despite differences at home. But now we see different political parties send different messages to Prime Minister Abadi with regard to oil, for example. Uh, let me elaborate on that for, for a minute. We had the uh, Prime Minister sign a deal about Kirkuk's oil and how it should be shipped. And then who is a KDP, the Prime Minister Nishvan Barzani. But then we see leaders from the, from the PUK send different messages that no, we don't want that oil to be. So basically a political party that's a partner in the government actually countering and undercutting the effort of the government uh, for partisan interests. You can also argue that maybe the effort of the Prime Minister was seen as partisan uh, interest. These internal dynamics are going to exacerbate, is going to weaken a key U.S. ally uh, in the region and in the fight against, uh, against ISIS. So U.S. goals, U.S. ethics, U.S. strategy dictates uh, greater political engagement with the Kurds, not only to ensure that the Peshmerga is, a, is an effective force in the fight against ISIS, but also that the region will remain stable because the U.S. has invested mm. tremendous effort in, uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan and the KRG. In addition to uh, my second point, in addition to internal fissures and fragmentation, I also wanted to comment briefly on, on the economy, which is a contributing factor to, to these fragmentations and the deterioration of, of local unity. Uh, Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan uh, depend on oil. It's a, it's a petro state. Kurdistan is a petro region. The economy is chronically dependent on, on oil. So with the tanking of oil prices, uh, everyone is, is, is running after whatever you know, breadcrumbs left uh, in the budget, in the economy. When a price of a barrel was, about, was greater than 100, there was enough to grease the wheels and, 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 and machines of government and also enough for uh, you know, elites and politicians and, the, and the, the corruption machine to work and skim off. But now there isn't simply enough, uh, enough money going around. And that's also one of the reasons why these fragmentation, these fault lines have actually uh, widened. So uh, just give you a couple of numbers. About 95% of the budget comes from oil. 75% of the labor force works for the government. Uh, the dream job of everyone is to get a university degree because that will guarantee you a... Uh, you know, a government job, and a government job is for life. You don't need to have any skills. It's a piece of paper that, you know, guarantees you a pension once you become 40. Uh, and, and therefore, there's nothing else going on. You know, the, the private sector, the, the, the promotion of a free market economy that was inserted in the Constitution remains aligned in the Constitution. The processes, the support of building those economic institutions, a private sector, a vibrant uh, entrepreneurial class, the, these are areas that the U.S. has been very successful in other parts of the world. Look at South Korea, look at, uh, look at Taiwan, look at the UAE. Uh, these are areas that with either direct U.S. help or with the U.S. being a model or nudging them in the right direction, the U.S. has had uh, you know, tremendous success. And Kurdistan has been receptive. It's the disengagement phases that Dr. Lauer highlighted has basically an opportunity that was, that was missed, a huge opportunity that was lost. The KRG has been very successful in wealth generation, in establishing an oil and gas industry almost from scratch, inviting international oil and gas companies to invest, to look for oil, to invest in it, to find oil, to generate tremendous wealth, billions of dollars. Where the KRG failed, unfortunately, and where the Iraqi government also failed, is in managing this wealth in making sure that this, the wealth is, is, an invest, is, is invested in infrastructure, is invested in a fashion that will spur economic development. Unfortunately, uh, much of the oil world has been spent on, on you know, partisan uh, patronage welding, 
uh, Iraq lies at the bottom, maybe at the top of the corruption uh, index. Uh, people distrust their government, and the moment that the oil prices crashed, the international oil prices crashed, crashed the Iraqi economy and the Kurdish economy went into a deep crisis, more in KRG than, than, uh, than in Baghdad, because the economic institutions were never were never built, were never put in place. And of course, in the absence of economic opportunities for youth, then again, we're going to you know, replay the situation of 2014 and then create incentives for the youth to join uh, all of these different militia groups that uh, Dilan was talking about. Remember, you know, I'm, I'm saying his name in Kurdish uh, rather than Dylan, which is a running joke this morning. Uh, so we need to think about post-ISIS Governance, post ISIS economic development opportunities for youth, not just you know in a transactional approach that there is you know a terrorist group we need to kill them and then we need to get rid of them, kick them out of the cities, and then all of these other political and economic uh, problems will just evaporate and people will you know uh, kiss hands. There needs to be engagement. There needs to be institutions. Uh, there needs to be a political process. Uh, nation-building process that will make sure that the ground won't be fertile for the next reincarnation of, of ISIS or any other group. Terrific. Thanks, Bilal. If I might, I'll, I'll pose to Delauer the question that he asked us to pose to him. Um, <laughs> what, what should U.S. engagement look like going forward? And I'd, and I'd like to pose that as well to other panelists who'd like to take that on after Bilal. Well, it, it, uh, for the past two years, um, uh, United States engagement has increased um, and its presence meant quite a lot to the Iraqis. In particular, had it not been for the United States intervention, the Kurds or the Kurdistan region of Iraq would not have survived the ISIS um, onslaught or attack and the communities would have suffered more. Uh, since then, uh, this closer collaboration has been increasing, and with the economic crisis, Kurdistan is even more dependent on, on America. So America has, has got a lot of leverages over the Kurdish leaders or Kurdistan regional government. And in Baghdad, uh, interestingly, just as much, uh, Abadi government would not have survived had it not been for the United States. And the Sunni groups the same, the parliament, uh, in the parliament and government. The uh, Shia groups are not admitting it, they are very shy uh, when it comes to America, but they are privately uh, indeed uh, admitting that uh, they look at, to America to provide that leadership. And imagine in every battle, uh, um, especially in the recent days, uh, America was calling the shots. So imagine the amount of leverages uh, available, but the American diplomats are very shy. They, they, the best they could do is to imply that they can do more if the Iraqis do the right thing. We can't that, afford to have that. There is, there's a deepening crisis. Uh, we do not expect the United States to, as I said, I, I want to uh, emphasize that no more troops, no more money, no more anything, but greater use of the leverages they have. And maybe in the, in the short term, as soon as Daesh is defeated, there will be a period where you spend less on military more on humanitarian and reconstruction processes. Well, that is, again, a lot of leverage. Uh, and providing that guidance for st stabilization for uh, um, uh, basically putting the house in order, uh, Iraqis are responsive. The Kurds are responsive. You, you will not believe how, when, it, when they come to a deadlock between them, the moment uh, a leader like Mr. Biden, for example, or uh, whether this uh, <coughs> any senior figure uh, turns up, they are all... Uh, responsive and they come under pressure and they hope that uh, it will be uh, to their satisfaction. i tell you one other thing. At the moment, uh, in Iraq, but especially in Kurdistan, I see that uh, the, the pressure is mounting on the leaders. The voters, the um, uh, free media, uh, they are very critical and they are very vocal. The international business that is present demands rule of law, demands uh, security for their business. And the uh, um, uh, military help, the international military help, is also expecting a lot from the Peshmergas and from the Iraqi defense. Imagine that pressure is there, and the responsiveness is there, but America needs to be slightly more assertive in saying, this is a partnership. Uh, we can do it together to prevent terrorism, to prevent radicalism, to prevent any source of trouble to Europe, to, to the United States. But we are going to be here. You help us out. So essentially, 
I don't need to go into nitty gritties, but, but that is enough to put the leaders under enough pressure to reactivate the parliament, to sit together, to dialogue, to agree vision. And they are intelligent, experienced. They're, they know what's coming. They know the challenges. They know the opportunities better than you and I. Why are they not doing it? Well, are, that's what we are. we are. We don't do it. Left alone, we will not do it. That uh, help coming from a friend and an ally and a, and a potential partner that, that has proven its commitment to the region and its friendship, it is, it is uh, going to uh, <coughs> steer it to the right direction. <coughs> I'd like to open this up to a wider conversation um, with the audience. Uh, um, if, uh, you can identify yourself when the mic comes around and I call on you, and if you can keep your uh, question as brief as possible so that we can keep uh, uh, space open for as many questions, that would be great, as many questions as possible. This gentleman in the back right here. Hi. Um, you spoke a couple times about, although the U.S. Did I trouble you to identify yourself? Oh, I'm Michael. I'm an intern of Hudson Institute. Thanks. Um, you spoke about, you know, the U.S. can mili or Iraq can militarily defeat ISIS in Mosul, but it lacks the ability to liberate it in terms of refugee support, reconstruction, and governance. What resources are needed in, by, like, from the international community, both you know, U.S., Baghdad, and allies, to meet those three ends? And does the U.S. have the agencies and the resources to provide those, especially issues like you know, establishing better governance in Mosul? Uh, I will say that I think that there's a capability deficit on the part of the U.S. government. I mean, there's a profound level of patriotic and very capable people serving in our State Department, but the State Department is fundamentally understaffed, and I don't think it is a, making the, the acquisitions in terms of the budgets and certainly not training up the next generation of personnel to be able to conduct the kinds of political engagement that DeLauer is uh, describing. And I think that the United States, which has been since 9-11 bending our various bureaucracies to meet the new strategic threats that we face globally, needs to think more proactively and long term about building up the real diplomatic, on-the-ground capabilities with which we can build the fortitude, the staying power, to be able to see this region, which is central to global security and our security, through this historical upheaval that it's experiencing. Uh, I think that there's real need to think through what, what, um, how to rebuild and reconstitute the State Department for this period. Mike, do you want to address that? Well, I would like to argue that there's no, no need to, uh, for the UN to and other in the international community to spend money on reconstruction in Mosul if you don't destroy it. You know, don't destroy it in the first place. Uh, do what works. Go in, develop an intelligence campaign, recruit sources, recruit people in the Iraqi military, and start decapitating ISIS leadership. It's what actually has worked in the past. We're not doing it now. We're simply resetting the conditions, like Dylan said, to the day before ISIS entered. ISIS, you know, I, I don't believe this strategy is going to defeat ISIS. I think this is going to push ISIS into an al-Qaeda model where it simply doesn't plant a flag. It's, it is still able to carry out high-profile attacks, to destabilize the government, to push the government to do things. Let's remember, Fallujah only happened after ISIS sent two car bombs into Sada City and killed 200 people. Fallujah was the first city that ISIS took over. Okay. It, it was left there for two and a half, almost three years, until it was convenient. It became convenient once ISIS, after losing Ramadi, sent two car bombs into Baghdad and killed 200 people in Sadr City, prompting Shia residents to run a body out of town and demand two things. I want the Iraqi security forces and the Shia militias to protect Shia population centers along the sectarian fault lines, and we want somebody punished for this. Fallujah became that target. Uh, you don't have to destroy these towns. You don't need to spend money on reconstruction if you don't destroy it. The, I want to hear the UN be as concerned about Ramadi and Fallujah right now as it is about this, this upcoming crisis in Mosul. If we do the things we're doing now, uh, rubbling towns, depopulating Sunni areas, replacing an ISIS flag with an Iraqi, Iraqi flag and calling it success. That's not what success looks like. Sir, up there. <clears throat> um, 
Well, my name is Mike Albin. I'm a, an independent researcher. The title of today's panel is The Imperative of Bolstering U.S. Allies. We've heard about a lot of internal within Iraq allies or potential allies, but are there regional allies? Who, who might they be? Uh, I took the title to mean that they would be they were regional rather than internal. Well, I think right now we need to think very clearly strategically about bolstering frontline allies, and they include Kurdistan and Iraq more generally, as well as Turkey, uh, which has absorbed an enormous number of refugees from the conflicts that are raging in Syria and in Iraq. Um, that's, of course, going to be extremely difficult to do because uh, the coup uh, that we saw happen uh, recently exposed a deeply factionalized Turkish state, and the post-coup era is exposing a deeply factionalized Turkish republic. Um, uh, this crisis uh, has enormous repercussions um, for the world, uh, number one, but it obviously also clearly affects uh, the capacity of the United States to cooperate with responsible governments in the region to deal with Mosul and the, the, the general meltdown of governance um, that we're seeing across the greater Levant. So I would put that at the top of the priority for, uh, in addition to working closely with Kurdistan and Iraq. Um, uh, thoughts on that? How, how, does, how, in fact, does the crisis in Turkey affect uh, your situation? Well, we all know that um, Turkey, for at least five years, it had a very clear policy towards Syria, towards Iraq, towards ISIS. Didn't change them until recently. And more recently, Turkey has become less predictable by the United States, less predictable by the uh, entire neighborhood. And the Turkish foreign policy behavior uh, has been directly uh, reflecting um, the, its internal um, turmoil and polarization and problems that it had. First started with the internal war, uh, then the coup attempt, then there has been more um, uh, uh, as a result of that. So this is now spilling over. This is now leading to um, confusion. And the, the first partner that is confused in this whole thing is the United States especially in Syria, because um, the fear is that um, maybe one day soon, maybe the uh, United States will be put on the spot to choose between two allies. One is a frontline uh, ally, the other one is a NATO ally. Well, I very much hope that none of these parties would drive the United States to choose. Uh, it's in no one's interest. Uh, but certainly, the uh, United States, in the same way as I mentioned for Iraq, uh, can uh, get deeper with the Turks engage them more and, and, and make sure that there is some sense coming out of, of the recent development. Because at the end of the day, if Turkey wants what it declared, then it's already getting it, almost. And that is a safer border. Um, ISIS is not there anymore. They're helping the FSA and uh, limiting the Kurdish advances uh, westwards, west of Euphrates. And that's where it should end, because that's what America wants. Because America doesn't want to lose the um, uh, Kurdish uh, formidable um, presence against ISIS and its advances. Any more erosion of that will be at the expense of the focus on ISIS and Raqqa, and Raqqa may not be liberated any time soon. So the United States can't afford that. So more dialogue, more engagement, more leverages, more of these uh, reconciliation between parties. I think the United States can also do one more magical thing not easy, not a, there's no magic want uh, to do that. But if uh, Turkey could be persuaded to restart its peace process internally, uh, every one of us would be in a better place. Yeah. Sir, over here. Hi, I'm Russ Reed with the Daily Caller News Foundation. If I could just borrow off Mike's point, um, going to push ISIS into an Al-Qaeda-like model now, we're, we're speaking about after Mosul. Is there a possibility after Mosul, if the situation occurs and they, the administration doesn't take your advice, destroys the city, creates a refugee problem, do we have a possibility of al-Qaeda reestablishing themselves in Iraq, or do we have a possibility for maybe some other group to take that vacuum that ISIS left? Well, to, to add to ISIS, uh, ISIS doesn't simply go away. I mean, when I say go into the Al-Qaeda model, um, again, ISIS 
is moving away from planting flags. Uh, once you plant a flag, they're learning quickly that unless you can shoot down American aircraft, you shouldn't plant a flag. Now, that's one of the biggest things they're learning right now. You know, you know, if you go into these places, develop your cells, conduct attack. I'm not telling ISIS what to do. I'm just saying this is what ISIS is doing. Um, you know, a lot of these groups. I mean, if, when we were fighting Al Qaeda in Iraq, we were also fighting 1920s Brigade, Jaysh al Muhammad, Ansar al Sunnah, all these other groups. Those groups have have folded under the ISIS umbrella, uh, or they've simply gone to ground. Uh, yeah, that, I just don't see how a Mosul campaign, if done the way it's uh, going now, will defeat ISIS. And if you look at everything from CERT in Libya to what's going on in Syria and what's going on in Iraq, every proxy force on the ground that the U.S. has been part of helping with close air support brokered an exodus for ISIS. ISIS fighters were allowed to leave Fallujah, Ramadi, to Crete. We're going to do that again with Mosul. And that's not how you defeat an organization by brokering a deal. Um, and it, the reason these deals are being brokered, because it's more advantageous to be able to say that Ramadi will be cleared by this date and have a flag planted in the city center. And then for the next three weeks, if you pay attention, you'll see that ISIS still has pockets. ISIS is still conducting attacks. But the flag's been planted, so the media moves on to the next thing. Uh, ISIS doesn't live in a 24-hour media cycle or on social media. In these, in these cycles is what I mean. So the strategy is not working. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw other organizations. And I've argued from the beginning that if ISIS simply turned into a, a secular nationalist Sunni movement, it would swallow 100,000 in 30 days. And the only thing to keep it from growing would be its inability to sustain itself financially. Sir, so over here. I'm not. Uh, I'm Nama Abdullah with Rudao. Uh, I have two questions, one for perhaps Michael or Eric can answer, and the other one for the Kurdish scholars. Uh, the first one, um, I sense uh, that the Obama administration is rushing the retaking of Mosul with a recent call from Vice President Biden to Abadi and Barzani stressing, quote unquote, the urgency of, of the operation. Do you see any significance of this operation in the context of the U.S. elections? for Hillary Clinton? Is it, is it going to be a big thing, given the fact that Hillary Clinton is basically saying she will have the same policies as President Obama, maybe step up the, the, the same policy? And the second question for uh, the Kurdish scholars, uh, do you feel there is a sense of betrayal uh, among the Kurdish people, especially Kurdish people in Rojava, after Biden's um, speech in Turkey? calling upon the Kurdish fighters to withdraw from the areas they had liberated from ISIS. Thanks. Mike. Real quick to the, to the urgency. Um, there were three things the administration put out, raids, Raqqa, and Ramadi. Ramadi's happened, Raqqa's not going to happen, uh, and the raids continue when we develop intelligence against high-value targets. hope I covered all those. Um, this ur urgency to start the Mosul offensive, I don't, I don't believe the Iraqi security forces are ready. Uh, no Sunni force, no hold force comprised of Mosulawis or people from Nineveh uh, to, to come in afterwards has been developed yet. Uh, and I think that this rush to have a success ahead of the election is a goal, but I don't see it happening. One of the most interesting things is, that's happening, and maybe this is a good thing, is Qasem Soleimani has been able to take Iraqi Shia militias and send them to Aleppo. Now think about that for a second. A, a legitimized force in Iraq is being commanded by an Iranian general to go to Aleppo. Uh, that may be a good thing, maybe it'll keep him out of Mosul, but I think all it really takes is for ISIS to have a couple high-profile attacks in Baghdad, and you'll see that October start date for the Mosul operation push back until, until spring or summer. But that's my take on that. Um, on the... Uh Kurdish feeling, um, I don't think there was a sense of betrayal, of a feeling of, uh, of betrayal, but there was a fear of betrayal. There was an immediate reaction to this um, call and for this uh, action that the Kurds suddenly thought that they have uh, sacrificed a lot to free um, and liberate Manbij, and uh, now suddenly they're told to go away. Their fear was that uh, America would agree to the Turks 
as well as FSA to come to Manbij rather than the Arab component or the local component of the uh, democratic uh, force. So that actually didn't last long, this reaction, because indeed the American uh, diplomats and American uh, colleagues uh, emphasize that they have never promised the YPG to continue from there and advance and keep Manbij and so on. There was an agreement, and that agreement was honored. And then later the Kurdish side accepted, indeed, there was an agreement of that sort, and that's all. But of course, while the YPG was um, planning and hoping and, uh, to advance further and even take Jarablus itself and so on, and they declared that, and this is what triggered Turkish response, that Turkish response was to stop them more than actually doing anything to any other party. So um, if things stop here, I don't think they would feel betrayed. But if the Turks decided to further go east and undermine or, say, erode the already consolidated presence of, of YPG in, in, in the other areas that they already have and, and it's been accepted by the United States. If that happens, if, the, if Turkey began to actually shell more Afrin and others, which they have been doing, this is a dilemma for the United States. This is the real test is. If the United States allow the, the Turkish forces and the pro-Turkish forces to take away what is already being given and earned, hard earned by them, uh, it will certainly be um, a, a very um, strong sense of betrayal and America would never uh, recover that trust and confidence in this strong ally that is fighting ISIS. Uh, people will then remember history where the United States did similar things in, in Iraqi Kurdistan and, and elsewhere. Hopefully these chapters are closed and not to be opened again. Just a quick uh, addition to that, uh, just two things from social media uh, about the fear. Uh, I think uh, uh, we started seeing a lot of people call Biden the second Kissinger going back to the time of the Algiers Treaty. So that was a sign of the fear, okay, whoops, this is happening again. Uh, but that was a very short episode, <clears throat> thank God. Uh, the other thing, again, from Kurdish uh, social media was about how the you know, adage that the Kurds have no friends but the mountains, uh, start people say, start saying, like, why? Why is this the case? You know, uh, but then uh, the funniest, probably most, most asked with comment I saw was a similarity between the United States and the Kurds, that they're very good at winning wars and losing the politics. So at least the Kurds and the Americans have, have that in common. <laughs> Positive twist on an otherwise negative sentiment. <laughs> Sir, in the front row. Air Commodore Tenaf, I'm the Dutch uh, defense attaché. Um, I would like to have your opinion on the way I look at this, that we're discussing on a small scale. The key is not defeating ISIS military. The key is bringing good humanitarian uh, effort firstly, so people get trust, and then have a good stability. And it's not only a U.S. national interest. It's a national interest of the EU, of my country uh, as well. Yeah. As with bigger key players, like Saudi Arabia, like Iran. So we're looking at a problem Mosul is only a step. Afterwards, stabilization of Syria comes in as well. And I think, and I agree with this gentleman, that we're looking very much internal uh, Iraq. We're only looking to uh, Mosul. I would like to have your opinion on how do you look at the broader picture. And also your remark, sir, this is just the way we are. I think there's also a limit on these kind of uh, argumentation because the public opinion in our countries also has a certain uh, stamina to continue on conflicts. So I think it, the region itself also needs to have a proper answer to this. We cannot stick in this, this is just the way we are. So, but I'd like to have your opinion on, the, on this, uh, in uh, just what I just uh, told. Thank you. You want me to say some hour, or would you like to? Well, I, uh, some of it that, that I could handle. Um, uh, we are not resigning to the fact that this is the way we are, but you have to deal with the reality the way it is, manage it and deal with it. And I've said that left alone, we will not be able to do it alone. But now there's enough recognition and desperate need for change, but they, if they don't know how, if they are not willing because of internal rivalry, well, here is pressure from outside, 
and uh, whether you like it or not, uh, you're in this for a long haul. It's not like um, if, the, if the Iraqis can't do it and they can pull out their refugees, their, uh, uh, in their millions are coming your way, the terrorism coming your way. So you have to do... But, but your keen interest should be sufficient to make you say, I want more for this common destiny, for this help that I'm bringing, for stabilizing country. And what is it that you're asking? What is it that you should be asking? Good governance, rule of law, institutionalization, less corruption. We can help you with that. But you keep coming asking for shopping lists, asking for more money, for more troops, for more Milans and for more tanks. And then you just uh, do what you do best. And that is not good enough. Well, what we want is really somebody to put their foot down and say, the only way to defeat terrorism is rule of law in your country. Where is it? We've done enough to help you. Where is it? And if you're not doing it, we are suffering. Why is it that ISIS was uh, had... In fact, I had, uh, in my previous incarnation, by the way, I was still actually mm -hmm. professor of medicine and when ISIS just about came. I had students from Mosul, used to go in and out of Mosul. They were telling me, since ISIS arrived, there was no crime, stability, there was so much more. That's what people looked for. They said, if you do not hear about the war and if they don't take your child to the war, it was heaven compared to the previous period where bombs were exploding, corruption everywhere, nobody trusted. So my point is, the only long-term solution for all these problems is for our leaders to do the right thing in terms of good governance, rule of law, institutionalizing, strengthening the institutional democracy. How that happens? By pressure, leverages. Because no politician, including the United States in Washington, will wake up in the morning and say, tomorrow I'm going to build this nation. I'm going to be a good guy. No, it's pressure they respond to. And the good news is they trust the Western help. They trust America. They trust, I'm not talking about at least some of them. They trust the European. And then when help comes that way, that's where you have the leverages and where, that's where the trust is, means something. So it's, we're not talking about really any more than that. Okay, just real quick. So the one thing I'd like to say about local, local allies and regional allies, Mosul has been under ISIS control for two and a half years. The whole international community has allowed that to happen. Fallujah was under control for three years. The Turkish border was, uh, was unprotected for, for two, two years. Turkey demonstrated an ability to shut down its border in a week that it, would, it had that same capability to do that the last two years, but it was only until the YPG started moving west of the Euphrates that they decided to move in. Baghdad only decided to do Fallujah after a series of attacks. Mosul has been left there. So when you look at regional allies, it took, it took a pilot to be burned alive in a cage to get Jordan to do something. It took terrorists in Saudi uh, to threaten the government for them to do something. Everybody has the luxury, and I'm sorry that this is a fact, the luxury of having Syria and Iraq to be the place where ISIS is, because it's over there. And if you look at the actions in Baghdad and in Iraq, uh, you hear people talking past ISIS. What's, how do we do this? How do we, how do we get all these things? I mean, Sadr shut down the government of Baghdad, not because he was upset with the way Baghdad was was uh, prosecuting the war against ISIS, but because he wasn't getting a paycheck from Baghdad. He had an opportunity to use leverage in Baghdad to, to push for Sunni reconciliation and for a more effective strategy to defeat ISIS. So the world has the luxury of ISIS being in Syria and Iraq, and now it's metastasizing in, in the Middle East and North Africa. To be able to see it from afar and do something about it with an airstrike, and that's one of the biggest disgraces of this campaign that 400,000 deaths in Syria, and now Iraq has a benchmark. When do people start caring about this? We haven't even got that close. What else can we do if we want to do it? Uh, so uh, regional allies should be ashamed of themselves, and there are a lot of political entities in Iraq and Syria that should be ashamed of themselves for allowing this to happen, for allowing these capitals to, to stay under ISIS control. And the same with this administration. It's been a problem they've been able to put their put distance on, and be able to tout successes when they've had a chance. And, and to me, it's, it's one of the, the biggest problems we have in generating a Sunni force to punish ISIS because the Sunnis are looking to the West. The Sunnis of the northern Middle East are looking to the West and not seeing the America they knew in 2007 or in 2008. There was a guarantor. There was an ally that, that was willing to use leverage in Iraq to kill something that was killing and eating away Iraq. Dylan. 
suppose I'm just echoing that really. <laughs> so we know we know what needs to be done, but yet they're still not done. You, you were talked about the humanitarian aspect. I mean, I've seen the plans that are there; they're all ready to go. But yet, how many people, IDPs are we ready for? About 120,000. How many do we think are going to come? A million. So you know, we we had this pledging fund here in Washington, 2.3 billion. I spoke to the people on the ground. I was like, so you have your plan? Where's what about the money? I heard it's coming, and they like haven't seen anything. You know, we we we're here. We're ready to go. Once you give me the money, I'm going there. I'm creating all this stuff. Two months, we'll be ready. Are they ready? No, because they don't have the money. But then coming into this humanitarian aspect, you know, we're talking to them to them as well, and they're saying, if it starts now, it'll take us two months to be ready. Then we'll be ready in winter. If it happens in winter, we're gonna, the increase of cost is going to go up by 30%. So we need more money. The loss of life is going to go up by 50% because of the conditions in these areas in winter. So therefore, no matter what, we're still not ready. You know, you're still looking at spring, even if this money comes. But the problem is, it hasn't come. And the problem is, we know what to, we know what to do politically, but it hasn't happened. So none of these things will happen. And it is in, as you said, it is in your international interest. It is in security interest, but yet it's still not happening. We're still saying, okay, we can defeat them militarily fairly easy. Let's forget about these other things. Is that they, you know, they take money, they take some planning, they take us to actually doing some action. To reinforce a little bit of what had been said, I mean, security is going to flow from responsible politics, which has been clearly the focus of a lot of what our panelists have addressed. But I'll agree with your observation that responsible politics will not uh, realize itself in a lot of these areas without. Um, especially given the geopolitical contest that we're seeing across the region. And one thing that the U.S. and its allies need to think clearly about and come to a common analysis about is how to draw red lines that actually matter and to reinforce them and to understand that that is, in fact, still our responsibility. Um, uh, there are clearly expansionistic and very aggressive powers in the region that are taking advantage of poor governance and, and, and exploiting these fissures in order to expand their own strategic interests across the region. There are other powers, um, uh, which are traditional allies of ours, uh, which may themselves also be involved in this. However, they're doing this largely because we're not providing the traditional security that we had done in the past. And without addressing that, then a lot of the on-the-ground political engagement, which will be required to reconstitute a political order that works for the people in the region, can't be done. Can't be done. Ma'am, you had a question? If you could wait until the microphone comes. Thank you. I'm Hedy from the Iraqi Embassy. Uh, I would like to make some points regarding what Mr. Michael um, just mentioned. Uh, about the al hajj al shabi or the Iraqi military forces when they enter the cities. They're actually facing a lot of challenges in the ground. If you um, read the news really, really precisely from the Iraqi sites, you'll find that there's a lot of exclusions that ISIS fighters left in the cities. So the military and the hajj al shabi are trained to face these challenges, to clean the city from the exclusion, exclusions. So the people who would like to come back, they will come back safely to their cities. This is one. Secondly, I would like to refer you all to the pledge conference that's been uh, handled last July, where the international community participates in it, which will help actually, and there's plans to help the Iraqis fight ISIL and to clean the city or liberate the city of Mosul from, um, from them. Uh, it is a huge challenge that the Iraqis are facing in, 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 a, in a state of uh, having this alone. We ask the community, the international community, to help because we are fighting terrorism on behalf of the world. I mean, last time I checked in the news, there is uh, a, an accident happened in uh, France where ladies were revenging for one of the ISIL fighters who's been killed in Iraq. Everybody is paying because of this terrorist group. And Iraq deserves to have this help from the world, from everybody. And I guess there is another good side in this, that I guess this challenge make the 
Iraqi parties and Iraqi people more united than before because the threat is for all, not for one. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can I go on to those please, points? Yes. So, first of all, you said that from an Iraqi perspective, the Hashtag Shabi is important to do these things. I mean, which Iraq? There are several Iraqs. Uh, if you talk about to the people in Nineveh, they, they don't think that the Hashtag Shabi is important to come in. You know, they've seen what happened in Fallujah. They've seen what happened to, to Crete. They don't want this to happen. And you're talking about the pledging. I mean, ple a pledge is a pledge. It's, it's not money on the table. No one has seen this money yet. So, you know, yes, you can come together in a room and say we're going to give this, mu this much money. But until you hand it over, it hasn't actually happened. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question, and we can certainly talk afterwards. I have to go to this gentleman right here. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rabaz Ali. I'm a journalist with Rodeo. Uh There's going to be a, a referendum in Kurdistan region sometimes in early November uh, before the U.S. elections. My question is... Is that a fact, or is, is that information, or is still, that... A, still is a fact. <laughs> still is a fact. So the date is... Yeah, there's, the date is not clear yet, but okay. it says that sometimes before the U.S. elections in November. Okay. What would, what would uh, uh, a possible independent Kurdistan mean to the future of, uh, of Iraq and the future of U.S. support to, to Iraq? Thank you. That is certainly a question for another panel. <laughs> <laughs> But I will say this, um, uh, you know, on my last trip to Kurdistan, um, uh, people were not talking about independence. Uh, instead, they were talking about the deteriorating internal political crisis within Kurdistan, uh, which, of course, has been exacerbated by um, the increasing rates of poverty, the insecurity that ordinary people live in, uh, among other things. Um, independence is not worth anything for Kurds and for their allies around the world if it's not viable independence. And the focus really needs to be for all peoples of Iraq right now to build up their institutions of sovereignty from which their true security will flow going forward. Uh, unfortunately, that has not been the focus of US policy. For a handful of us, there's a number of analysts and others in Washington that have worked for several years um, hoping to encourage more direct US security assistance to Kurdistan. Uh, and so in that respect, some of the assistance that was announced recently by the Obama administration that would go directly to the Peshmerga was seen as somewhat of a victory. Unfortunately, I've always felt that that security assistance needs to be made dependent or contingent upon the actual integration of the Peshmerga militias. Uh, because why? The militias, the Peshmerga integrated, turned into a modern military could become also a vehicle for political integration between the various Kurdish factions. Um, uh, unfortunately, that hasn't been uh, at, the, at the front of, of the US, uh, new US uh, agreement with Kurdistan. Um, and so I, I worry that unwittingly, current focus on the Mosul campaign might actually be inadvertently contributing to Kurdistan's long-term insecurity. Uh, I think all of a sudden our short-term perspective on security assistance has probably helped to exacerbate some of the divisions within Kurdistan and also the divisions between Erbil and Baghdad. And uh, we need all to think more clearly about the political outcomes that we're seeking and to make sure that we have a political strategy in place so that our military victories produce the lasting strategic outcomes that we all want. Um, with that, I'm going to have to conclude because I want to be respectful of everybody's time, but I really want to thank all of our panelists, including those who came from afar and our, our Washingtonians as well for a really a rich and rewarding discussion. We'll convene again. Thank you very much. <laughs>